Our second panel of the afternoon uh, is titled Authoritarian States, Nationalism, and the Unruly Media. Um, and we have three speakers uh, for, this, um, for this second panel. And I'll introduce each of them again uh, and then and turn it over to them, um, just brief introductions. Our first speaker will be uh, Professor Michael Curtin from University of California at Santa Barbara, where he is a professor of film studies and also the uh, Melichant Professor of Global Studies uh, as well. And uh, Michael has written uh, considerably, uh, not just about China, but about other parts of Asia, and, and also you'll see in his comments today, I think, as well, um, but uh, has done really um, interesting work on uh, media industries uh, in China, uh, television, um, but also in other parts of, of Asia and other parts of the world, too, as well, um, focusing a lot on impacts of globalization and those kinds of themes. Um, Following uh, Michael, we'll have um, Tim Weston, um, uh, Associate Professor of History and also the Associate Director of the Center for Asian Studies here at CU Boulder. Um, uh, Tim's area especially is kind of modern Chinese history, and he's been doing a lot of work on journalism and media in, um, in contemporary and in uh, recent uh, Chinese history as well. And then um, Anne Subianto uh, will will wrap things up for us um, on this panel. Uh, Anne is a, a graduate a PhD student in the College of Media Communication and Inf Information uh, here at uh, uh, CU Boulder, and she is um, completing her dissertation on on the revolutionary press and uh, in Indonesia. Um, and so uh, it'd be great to hear her comments uh, following up from what uh, Indy was talking about this morning as well. So um, please uh, welcome Michael first. First of all, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the folks at the Center for Asian Studies, the staff, um, Tim Oakes, Tim Weston. Um, also like to thank uh, Nabil uh, Achaibi uh, and, um, and Stuart Hoover, who are here somewhere, Stuart Hoover, and the folks from the uh, College of uh, Media Communication and Information. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I am not an area specialist. Um, I, uh, I have actually been spending much of my time um, trying to become something more of a comparative and global scholar, which means I know a lot of things, a little bit about a lot of things, and, um, and as we go on, it'll become apparent as I'm trying to make comparisons that I'm running along at a rather fast pace and, and drawing comparisons between areas uh, where maybe we need to dig deeper, and so I invite your feedback and, and comments on, on some of the things I'm up to. Um, I wanted to begin by taking us back to the 1990s and thinking about the first point at which people were sort of seriously engaging with this idea of mediating Asia um, as a truly transnational phenomenon, uh, which would have a kind, a level of engagement which would su surpass anything that had come before. And of course, we think a lot about the internet now, but it was satellite and satellite television in particular that uh, was the thing that heralded a lot of the anticipation about what a transnational Asia might look like. And one of the very first um, enterprises to engage in this, this form of mediation was called Star TV. And this is 1992. Star TV was launched in 1991 out of Hong Kong, which was at that point the center of Chinese um, popular culture and popular media on a transnational basis. So it was rather logical that Star would be based there. Launched in 1992, and you can see it had two transponders, and this is the footprint um, that they were telecasting across. And in the paper, I go into some detail about the launch of Star, um, the ambitions, uh, the ambitious notion that Star would bring people together in ways that had never been seen before, and would augur a transformation in politics around the world as authoritarian regimes would never again be able to um, sequester information within their boundaries. And so that was, the, that was the imagination of STAR, which is a commercial enterprise, then was taken over by Rupert Murdoch. And I talk a bit about that. Um, but um, I start with STAR because I want to, I want to think about, as, as we've entered into an era of increasing globalization with media, the erosion of national borders has raised questions about 
where in the world where our, will our media come from? And I think particularly about film and television as being important media still, even in the age of the internet, largely because film and television is where we go to dream our dreams, to exercise our fears, um, to imagine futures, to think about relationships. And so I'm, I'm especially interested in television and film as, as media that continue to captivate a large uh, amount of our time and our imagination. And my question is why in a globalizing environment are some cities, some places in the world becoming centers of this transnational media? And I call these places media capitals. So in fact, I'm going back a little bit to where we began today when Andy was saying, well, why isn't Indonesia getting its voice out there? And so my thinking as far as comparative work has been concerned is to think about those places that have become centers of the transnational media cap uh, economy. And I think of them in terms of what I refer to as media capital. Capital both as a place and a process. Capital as geographic centers and capitals as places that accumulate resources, reputation, and talent that actually bring people together for the production of commercial film and television. So I'm thinking about centers and spheres of circulation, cities as nodes in transnational flows, and Hong Kong, Hollywood, Mumbai, Dubai, Beirut, these became emblems of middle class and modern aspirations because they were situated within cosmopolitan networks. They were relatively stable, which made them good places to invest in things like studio infrastructure and to build the, the networks that were necessary for distribution. And they also, because of that, they grew media enterprises that had expansive aspirations. Not simply national aspirations or local aspirations, although they had those too. But they actually had aspirations to reach beyond localities and nationalities, reach even further afield. They also brought various media together. So these media capitals, historically, there are certain reasons why some places and not others. And what we see in these cities is that they share institutional characteristics. They're very much commercial media institutions with a fixation on their audiences and an industrialized techniques of both um, generating products passing along talent between generations of workers, developing distribution uh, systems, and gathering financial resources. They also have particular kinds of creative environments where they're able to, um, uh, because of a whole variety of institutional arrangements and personal relationships, they're able to foster communities of creativity. And finally, the texts that come out of them are conceived with global awareness. Media in these places are not simply thinking about what's going on where they are. They're thinking about things that are happening in other parts of the world. They're very much wired into networks, whether it's international trade shows, whether it's film festivals or whatever. They're very much wired into global networks and alert to what's going on out there, which then they, they absorb in the making of their own products with an eye to their, their audiences that they've imagined. And so these are global texts that they conceive, but with particular audiences in mind, distinctive texts that, are, that can only survive in the marketplace so long as they distinguish themselves from, for example, Hollywood product, or as long as they distinguish themselves um, from Arab or South Asian or East Asian media products. Uh, media capital marks and exploits difference. That's how value is constituted through in, um, commercial enterprises. So if I were to map the world, just to give you an idea of some of the places I'm studying, these are commercial media capitals. You see places like Istanbul. Um, uh, here you see uh, Dubai. You see uh, Mumbai, Beirut, um, uh, Hong Kong in its prime, Lagos, Nigeria, Miami, places like that. We also have seen the emergence of places that I call service centers. They don't have the capacity to operate as media capitals, and I won't go into why, but they do have other capacities and they get tapped. So for example, a lot of Indian films are not shot in India, Bollywood films. The film crews actually go to places like Sydney, um, go to places uh, uh, in Europe like Budapest to shoot the films. Um, and so these service centers have arrived. Uh, arisen. But then as well, we've also, in response, we've seen over the last 15 years the emergence of what I refer to as official media capitals. We've seen states that are very concerned 
about the competition from these commercial centers and therefore have invested a lot of resources in uh, constituting themselves as a transnational presence, or at least investing in the infrastructure with an eye to do that. And Beijing is one of uh, the obvious examples, uh, and China, we'll talk a little bit about the China situation, just as an example of how this operates. Um, but we've also seen this in the Gulf states uh, with Dubai. We see it in other parts of the world. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that notion of official media capital as well and this tension that, that is at work in global media. First of all, we go back to the issue of Hong Kong. Hong Kong in the 1990s was the center of Chinese popular culture, whether, whether it was music, whether it was film, um, whether it was celebrity culture, it was Hong Kong, right? And it was pouring into the mainland um, it, through informal networks. It was uh, alive in diasporic networks. It was alive throughout Southeast Asia. And all of a sudden, Hong Kong starts to attenuate and dissipate. And there are a lot of reasons why, but it starts around 1997. And you might remember the significance of that date. Um, part of that had to do with the problems of the industry. Part of it also had to do with very specific policies to rein in Hong Kong. Um, policies from Beijing to rein in Hong Kong, and at the same time to recenter Chinese popular media around the mainland market. And the way in which this was executed was made, the path was made a lot easier by the fact that China was going through a tremendous growth phase in the 2000s. Um, GDP on a, on, on a, a purchasing parity basis uh, increased sixfold between 2003 and 2016 making it now a, an enormous economy, world's largest TV market, the second largest advertising market in dollar figures, second largest theatrical market, is, has just overtaken Japan in that sense. And so there's now a, a kind of market pull going on. Beijing has been able to exercise a lot of policy influence in part because it's become such an important market. And if you're thinking about producing Chinese media, 10 minutes. Oh, I'm doing better than I am here. If you're thinking about producing Chinese media or even an East Asian product, you have to think about the mainland market in order to get it financed. So there was a guy that I know, uh, and there's a producer I know, Peter Chan, very famous filmmaker, uh, worked in Hong Kong. He put together this company that had um, producers and directors from Thailand, Japan, South Korea, and what he called films that he was going to make for chopstick culture. And Peter Chan wanted to make movies for East Asian youth culture, right? He was thinking of these transnational audiences, these kids that shared pop, popular culture across national boundaries. And it was very much young people who were living in major urban areas. So it was Seoul, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Taipei, um, Bangkok, uh, Singapore. That, that was the audience he imagined. Peter Chan is now making movies for mainland China, right? The industry changed so inexorably, so so definitively towards this market pull towards the mainland. So on the one hand, market pull's been at work. The other thing that's been at work here as well is PRC policy, a policy of marketization, not actually, not actually free markets, but the use of market mechanisms in order to achieve certain objectives. At the same time that there's been a massive infrastructural investment in television and filmmaking, the favoring of national champions like CCTV and China Film, um, a, a, an attempt to create a blockbuster culture in the production of uh, feature dramas and melodramas, uh, favoritism to certain uh, producers, uh, firewalls, surveillance and censorship, of course, and all of this going on with a mindset of exercising soft power as a transnational phenomenon. It's not just about being able to command the attention of audiences in China. It's about projecting certain images about creative capacities of China and what China has um, to offer the world creatively. The center of all this is no longer Hong Kong. It's the Chaoyang district of Beijing. And instead of the kind of global text that I was talking about with respect to commercial media capitals, during the first phase, there was a lot of emphasis on historical dramas, 
Um, historical dramas were wonderful because they celebrated Chinese civilization. Uh, they also displaced political and controversial issues into a distant past, and so they could be mediated through that. And so we had this rolling out of historical dramas that begins with Crouching Tiger and runs on to things like Warlords and Bodyguards and Assassin. But we also had main melody films, you know, films that were being explicitly produced about um, about model cadre and uh, about um, uh, great historical leaders and campaigns and whatever. And two of the great epics of this tradition were the founding of a republic for the 60th anniversary of the PRC and the founding of a party, the 90th anniversary of the CCP. I was in Beijing teaching in the summer of 2011 when the founding of a party was playing in theaters and people, <laughs> actually nobody was going, but they had to rack up the statistics for it. So what they would do is you, they would sell you the ticket through the computerized ticketing system, and they would scrawl on it, Kung Fu Panda. That's what people wanted to see. And so they were actually generating the statistics, but people were actually going to the theater at that time to see Kung Fu Panda, uh, Kung Fu Panda 2. Now, the state has sort of like decided that maybe that's not going to work so well. And so they're shifting a lot of attention now to animation. Uh, Kung Fu Panda 3 is now going to be produced in Shanghai at DreamWorks New Studio. Um, and uh, they see animation as being sort of the next phase, like the historical dramas, a kind of displacement, uh, a politically palatable environment, technologically sophisticated production that's potentially exportable. OK, that's my timer. What's, I don't know. You've got the same? I'm done. OK, that's 15. OK, so um, basically what, I, what I'm thinking about is the, the, in a world of globalizing media, what are we seeing as emerging as the transnational centers? And what are the politics at play between commercial media capitals and official media capitals? Um, and in thinking this through, um, I, can, I won't actually go through this, but why has official media capital arisen? It's arisen in response to the, the kind of competition and threat from commercial media capital. And I won't go through that stuff except to say it's also, and in the paper I wrote for this, I talk a lot about South Asia. I talk a lot about um, what's happening in the Middle East. It's not just happening in China. There's very much policy like this going on uh, with the creation of media cities in, in the Middle East. Um, we were talking about Qatar and uh, Al Jazeera, their investment in media, Egyptian media uh, production city has also been built, and even in Saudi Arabia, um, their, their latest economic development involves a media sector. One of the most closed and uh, censorious environments on earth is now thinking of trying to turn itself into a media capital. Now, what are the burdens of this official aspiration? What are the problems? Well, obviously, bureaucracy, infrastructural bias, instrumental ideology, Audiences, of course, are not dumb. They're suspicious. What do they do? They turn to informal economies in order to acquire what it is that they want for uh, product. And whenever there's a showdown between commercial and official media capital, commercial media capital usually wins because it's so focused on audiences. And here, the Chinese example is particularly instructive because what are the most popular movies being made now? There are these small budget films that um, are, are, you know, I mean, they're kind of puff, but they're very engaging to the audiences in a whole variety of ways. And with these small budget films, they've commanded a lot of box office. They've actually achieved on the margins of that massive state investment, they've started to achieve that engagement with the audience that the state has not been able to realize. We've also seen in outside Chaoyang and Shanghai, a lot of activity that's trying to work its way around a lot of these official media policies. And then finally, let me just finish with saying that I don't see this as an either or. You're either official media capital or commercial media capital. I'm thinking of it more as a field. So commercial media capital is processual, dynamic, dialogical. Official is strategic, administrative, and monological. But I think there's also differences between formal uh, media capitals, where there's a, a, a higher uh, level of maturity, uh, there's kind of bureaucratic and procedural systems in place, and more informal um, media capitals, like Lagos, Nigeria, which is very immature, unruly, and opportunistic as a media capital. So I sort of charted out a field here to give you an idea of how we might think about this. And don't think of this as a static kind of 
representation, media capitals actually shift position within this field. And of course, the fun part is, as a parlor game, where would we put certain cities that have become centers of transnational media activity? And that we'll leave that for the discussion if anybody wants to quibble with my locations. Anyhow, thank you very much. Um, so I uh, am a historian. I teach in the Department of History here at CU. Uh, and I work on uh, the history, the early history of uh, Chinese newspaper journalism. Um, I'm in the process and have been for a long time writing a book on um, late 19th and early 20th century uh, Chinese newspaper journalism. And uh, therefore, this the subject of our symposium is, is of great fascination to me. Uh, I don't work uh, so much on the contemporary times, but I live in them. Uh, and I spent a fair bit of time in China. Uh, and I'm very concerned about uh, a variety of issues related to China, but also uh, Sino-American relations. Uh, so I was thinking about what to write about for this um, symposium and thought, well, I write a, I'm already writing about journalism in China. Uh, but this is really much more focused on the local uh, and the contemporary moment. So what linkages can I draw? Um, and then I had this interesting experience just uh, recently where I was invited uh, to go to um, New York City to be a reviewer for Freedom House. I don't know if anybody uh, is familiar with that. Freedom House is a, uh, a media, freedom of speech protecting uh, organization. It's, a, it's an NGO based in New York, and there are several of these. And it was a fascinating. I, was, I was, guess I was called to do this because uh, I write about the Chinese media, and I also write about contemporary China. It was interesting to me, but one of the things that I thought about when I was there is what, are, what is it exactly we're engaged in here? Um, we are using certain kinds of American normative standards, uh, which are not merely American. They've become um, much broader than that, uh, to make these judgments about every single country in Asia. Uh, most of which I knew almost nothing about in terms of the details of their media, um, their media situation. So it was questions uh, having to do with what is it? What is the place of the United States in critiquing uh, the Chinese uh, media environment that led me uh, to the paper I want to talk about now, which the title of which um, I'm calling "Finger Pointing in Both Directions: The Politics of Sino-American Discourse on Press Freedom, Past and Present." Um, and basically, as a historian, this is a tracing of a, a subject of change and evolution, transformation over time, trying to look both at continuities but also at changes and breaks. Uh, so forgive me, I'm going to do a little bit more of a traditional reading out of the paper than um, others have been doing. Uh, relations between China and the U.S. have always, of course, played out on a range of different levels, formal and informal both. Uh, negotiations between political leaders have manifestly played a central role. Uh, this is really obvious. The agreement between China and the U.S. to limit carbon emissions is but one good recent example. Uh, it was worked out in the quiet halls of power. The negotiations that led to that agreement were largely unknown uh, to the publics of either country before they were announced to the world, that back in November. Uh, that was a closely held process, and a great many other points of government-to-government -government contact proceed similarly. But as we all know, uh, Sino-American relations ha uh, have also played out informally in the media, among other places, which includes, and for, for my purposes, traditional press forms, newspapers, broadcast, journals, as well as more recently, the myriad forms of information and opinion dispersion that take place online through other digital platforms. Uh, in contrast to the carefully managed formal realm of high-level state-to-state policy formation, the wider-ranging discussion, I'm calling it, between China and the U.S., and you might just say discourse, uh, between China and the U.S. That, uh, that's taking place, uh, broadly construed, is wide open, unruly, and points in many different directions at the same time. Thanks mostly to the democratization uh, of the media and of publicly available conversation, uh, in general, brought about by digital forms of communication, this informal discussion between China and the U.S. has become a sprawling, multivocal affair made up of both established media institutions and an uncountable number of alternate uh, discursive pathways. The latter react to and engage with the established media outlets in, in a dialectical fashion, but a great deal of conversational material uh, that maintains full independence from the mainstream media is also disseminated uh, via the internet and other communications technologies. This situation is, of course, in no way unique to the China-US relationship. 
uh, it's global. Uh, but I think the particular uh, changes that we've seen as a result of the uh, moving across time and the new media forms uh, has transformed that particular relationship perhaps more than others. So the main thing I want to get at here, and it's very interpretive, uh, is to place what I would say today's uh, disorderly, dynamic, and transnational media conversation uh, between the U.S. and China, and that's only one bilateral uh, point um, in, in a broader historical context. So I'm going to skip around uh, over the course of the 20th century very quickly uh, since there's not much time. Um, and the basic uh, argument would be uh, that uh, the discussion between the China and the United States about the nature of the press as a social institution has moved from being interactive but wholly dominated by the U.S. in the early 20th century. Um, and the U.S. was the norm setter, uh, and I'm talking here about the Republican era, which is the early 20th century, to being locked in a parallel non-interactive ideological universes during the Maoist era, to being interactive but contentious during the post-Mao pre-internet era, and finally to being multivalent and transnational in our own time. So when I say uh, the U.S. was dominant uh, in the early 20th century, uh, what I'm mostly talking about and what I mostly draw on here um, is the fact that uh, when newspapers were first being founded or conceptualized as a professional product uh, and journalists as, as professionals who have a particular kind of training and a particular kind of role in society, uh, at that moment of time in early 20th century China, the United States was uh, very much uh, a, a model. And the reasons for that I go into actually in a different paper, but uh, ask you to trust me on that. One of the ways in which we see that is that um, when China first starts uh, organizing journalism schools uh, in the uh, early 1920s, um, they are founded by Americans uh, who are working at missionary colleges, uh, Yanjing in Beijing and St. John's in Shanghai. Um, the personnel who go and teach in these places are very frequently Americans. The textbooks they're using are the same that they used back in the US. Uh, these, the profs come mostly from either the University of Missouri or Columbia, which are the two major uh, institutions at that point in time, uh, two still very important ones today. Uh, the textbooks they're using are the same ones because they're teaching in English to their Chinese students. Um, they are also um, bringing Chinese students to Columbia, Missouri, and Columbia, New York University, um, and uh, inculcating in them American standards of journalism. Um, those standards, what were they? Well, one could go on at, at length, but I'll sort of boil them down to three key ideas that I think are important. Uh, one, a commitment to the idea of freedom of the press. Two, a clear distinction between news and opinion. Uh, and third, this concept of the journalist as a professional. Uh, somebody who uh, took the, had a sense of responsibility, uh, had a training, um, and had particular skills that uh, not just anybody uh, could pick up. So there is this generation, uh, early 20th century generation of people who are imbibing this uh, nor American normative values about uh, what a journalist should be and how to practice journalism. And these American values are uh, considered not only by the teachers in the US, but also I think by their students as not merely American, but also actually un of universal relevance. Um, they become a yardstick uh, that is uh, taken back to China by the, the students. But they also become a yardstick by which these same people can uh, evaluate the American media or other medias. Um, and this is something quite fascinating. Uh, there was a conference in um, Honolulu in 1921 called Press Congress of the World. It was put on by Americans uh, who were uh, very uh, much trying to counteract uh, the, the negative uh, nationalistic press of the World War I era by bringing journal uh, journalists from a variety of different countries uh, to one place in Honolulu to talk about how should we as journalists think of ourselves and our role in international relations. Um, and actually, as I was listening to Andy Bayouni's presentation, uh, I thought uh, about some of these remarks. I, I want to draw attention to a couple of the remarks that some of the Chinese participants at this conference made, and they made them in beautiful English because they were students and had been students in this country. Um, and what we see is that now the standards uh, are being turned on the American press. Okay, so uh, here's one from um, somebody named uh, Dong Xian Guang, who is Hollington Tong. Uh, some of you may know who he was. 
Um, he says at this conference, unfortunately, China has been ignored in the past, in the very recent past, but China can be ignored no longer, for this is the beginning of the Pacific era. This is 1921. The great issues of the future will be Pacific issues, and there is no Pacific issue in which China is not concerned. Accusing Western, and then accusing Western papers of inadequate reporting on China, he continues, will they ever think of sending to Germany a correspondent who does not know something of the German language, uh, German history, and German thoughts? Or to France, a man who perhaps is not simply ignorant of the French language and literature of French history and ideals, but who despises them. That is more or less what they do when they send men to China. Uh, and there are others uh, that, that I could read off that sort of make the same uh, general point, that, that uh, the US uh, journalism or Western journalism, more broadly speaking, aren't living up to their own ideals, stated ideals. And in fact, uh, if you're going to say these are universal values, then you had better adhere to them yourselves. Um, so you're beginning to see this kind of nationalistic um, uh, pushback from China against the West as being the authority uh, both on what journalism is and how to report. We come to the post-Mao era and we see, um, of course, the, uh, the replacement of uh, this, these American journalistic ideals, which had never been wholly, uh, had never really taken root, with the Leninist model of, uh, of the press, namely that uh, the press is there to serve the interests of, uh, is a class phenomenon, a class institution, uh, that the bourgeois press in the US and elsewhere is just that, it's a, a prop of power. Um, that it is, a, and it is a tool of exploitation and domination, uh, and that therefore the party as the vanguard uh, is entitled and in fact is, uh, is in the political, uh, doing the right political thing by taking over uh, in a dictatorial fashion and treating the press uh, essentially as a tool um, uh, and treating uh, in that same press uh, the bourgeois world uh, as, as it was called by the press, um, as being corrupt, backward, uh, full of deep class divisions, and so on and so forth. Now the Chinese press, in other words, uh, the PRC press is uh, attacking the United States in a variety of different ways, but among other ways, it's saying your press is fraudulent. Your press is part of your game. Uh, your press itself uh, is uh, something that uh, you can't actually uh, uh, take pride in. The US coverage uh, of China during the, this period, the Maoist era, wasn't uh, particularly subtle either. Uh, part of the reason for this is that uh, there was little access to China, uh, but there was far more information available, uh, I think you can say, than was actually uh, digested very well. Um, but what you see and what I'm trying to drive at here is this, this basic point that you have these two medias that are essentially what I'm saying existing in parallel universes of meaning, sort of mirror images of one another where there's really not any serious interaction. Instead, they are foils for one another uh, and they are being responded to but not actually using one another as a way of uh, interacting and gaining traction in terms of ideas. I'm moving fast. Uh, when we get to the post-Mao era, uh, things shift a great deal. Uh, and I think one of the things we might say is that the United States journalists are allowed in for the first time in a long while. Uh, I think that predisposes them uh, to be uh, sympathetic to China. Uh, there is this sense that China is uh, opening up and changing and becoming more like us. Therefore, we're, we're going to be reporting it um, in a way that is sympathetic. Um, not entirely, but the China story was a good story. It was a positive story. The Americans were rooting for China and the journalists were helping them to do that. Um, and so I think you see in the press of that time an underlying uh, optimism in the narrative, in the broader narrative. It was appearing, in fact, that actually this parallel universe, uh, these, uh, these, this place where these ep uh, epistemic uh, interpretation never met before are now starting to, to meet again. Um, but there is also, I think quite clearly, an American uh, condescension uh, that, that we can detect here. Um, there is um, the sense of triumphalism. Uh, that now that the Soviet Union is collapsing, now that China is uh, moving toward uh, market-style economics. So there is this kind of ambivalence in attitude in the press in the United States. Um, and it's boiling down a lot that I wrote, but to, to that basic idea. Um, for its part, uh, the Chinese media, I think, was 
uh, also generally uh, fairly um, kind in its treatment relative to what it had been of the United States. Uh, there was always criticism, but that almost became something that you had to get through until you got to the more important meaning. Um, and the press no longer was in the business of demonizing the United States. Uh, that had been uh, a, an old preoccupation. Uh, but now the United States was being, uh, I think, treated as a place that, you know, that China can work with to help it through its modernization process. Um, the U.S. was no longer merely a society full of racism, crime, inequality, and so forth, but actually um, a, uh, a modern, wealthy society to which Chinese uh, could, in some ways, aspire. Okay. Tim is giving me the signal. Um, actually, I'll take this moment. I'm not going to quit, but I'm going to take this moment just to say that I think Tim Oaks looks great in a tie. Um, he, he, he doesn't wear ties very often. So I, I hope I just bought myself a few more moments with, with that co compliment. Because um, I do want to talk about, um, I want to talk about uh, the, the I have much to say here about Tiananmen, but I'm not going to uh, have a chance to get to it. I guess the point I'd like to make uh, in, in the last part of the paper is that um, you know I was listening to Melissa's talk uh, with great interest um, and uh, you know the experience she personally had, but also uh, that we know others are having, uh, and not only journalists but lawyers and so forth. Um, and it's a very uh, glass is half full, uh, a half empty view. Um, and I think some of the questions and responses were, well, perhaps um, that's not the only. Uh, way to think about this. Um, certainly there's a lot uh, that's, that's not uh, particularly uplifting going on. Um, when I look at the internet and I hear all of this uh, discussion about um, uh, censorship of the internet, um, uh, you know, I have somebody who experiences it, we all do, if we go to China, we try and work with China, uh, it's something that's there, but I still can't uh, help but feel that overwhelmingly compared with when I was first going to China um, in, the, in the 80s, that this is a completely transformed society, that there is so much more common ground, that there is so much more room for discussion, that there are so many more interesting ways in which people are uh, talking with one another. That, in other words, it, just looking at the US-China part, but one could, of course, and should, for this comment, broaden it, it's a transnational discourse now. And the China, and it's not only, it's not one way, it's not Chinese uh, uh, and Americans, it's Chinese in the United States and Chinese in uh, China, it's Americans in China and Americans in the United States, it's Chinese and Americans in the United States talking to Chinese and Americans in, in China. There are so many new combinations uh, uh, coming into being and I think uh, what, what my, my linkage of this to the the history I've just uh, told is that I think what we're seeing is uh, a return uh, or a, an evolution to a place where uh, both of these medias, and in particular their relationship to the question of what the value of uh, freedom of the press, are engaged in a common uh, conversation. And so I'll just say my very last um, point here. Um, much of the um, the the mainstream Chinese and American medias are now a subject of conversation in their own right, no longer the conversation itself. So I think what we've done is we've really, uh, in a different world now, where the media has critiqued one another openly and there's talk back, there's response, there's interaction. Uh, it's, it's anything but uh, totally open and transparent, but um, so much uh, there to look at and chew on. Um, so I'd like to emphasize the extraordinary degree to which things are dynamic and open and fluid and possible. Thank you. I'm Rianne, go by Anne. Uh, I'm a PhD student at CMCI and I'm currently, currently finishing my dissertation. Um, I brought you some pictures here. So it's fascinating today that we've heard so much about author the authoritarianism of uh, communist China. What I'm going to talk to, to you uh, today is uh, actually I'm going to bring you to communist movement uh, almost a hundred years ago in, in, in the Dutch East Indies, which is now Indonesia. Uh, and at that uh, time, it was the October Revolution has just uh, occur, had just occurred in 1917. So actually it's a very optimistic time. Uh, it's a pre-Stalinist uh, communism or 
so it's a very different story of communism. That's what I want to mention. Uh, and also to, this morning we heard uh, Andy Bayuni uh, said that when we hear the story of Indonesia today, right, we hear a lot about Muslims in connection with ter terrorism or even Muslims and democracy. A uh, hundred years ago, a different picture actually took place. Uh, the Muslims at that time moved themselves in a communist anti-colonial struggles again against Dutch imperialism. And for three centuries, struggles against uh, Dutch imperialism has been sporadic, local, and traditional in character. In this period, people organized themselves for the first time in a radical, national, and global revolutionary movement. So the period is between 1918 until 1926. In that struggle, a tradition of a mix of Islam and communism became the basis. And while previously anti-colonial struggles had resor resorted to weapons and warfare, this time it was organized through schools, public debates, popular journalism, art, and literature. Um, so this is my dissertation research. And today, I'd like to discuss the history of the revolutionary press during this period, specifically the role of the revolutionary press in organizing Indonesian nationalism and anti-colonial struggles. In revisiting the history of the revolutionary press, I want us to consider two things. First, how journalism has played a role in social change in general, not just in Indonesia, and what specific aspects of journalism can play an effective role in social change. But second, and perhaps more importantly, how the issue of press freedom and government policies and regulations of the press have been tied closely to the state, and in the case of Indonesia, how the current Indonesian policy on the revolutionary press or revolutionary movement in general, general reflects colonial policies of more than a century ago. The period of the revolutionary press in Indonesian press history is a very brief eight-year period ranging from 1918 to 1926. And at this time, we should be aware that there is no idea of Indonesia as an independent nation state yet. It was still ruled by the Dutch colonial government, which had been there for about 300 years then. And the natives had only recently began to enjoy greater access to education and politics due to the Dutch new ethical policy. Now, the Dutch new ethical policy is kind of similar to the white man's burden narrative in uh, British uh, colonial India. So the emergence of the revolutionary press was facilitated by the growth of the native vernacular press and of native political organizations in the first two decades after the turn of the 20th century which were made possible by the enactment of the ethical policy. Around this time, the first organization explicitly to serve the common people, and really their uniting word is uh, called Kromo people, and Kromo means little people, common people. Uh, the name of the organization is Sarekat Islam, it's Islamic Union. It was founded. So it was founded in 1913, and later in 1920, split into two sections, the White Islamic Union, and the Reds Islamic Union. While the White Isla uh, Islamic Union remained collaborative in its approach to the colonial government, the Red one affiliated itself and actually uh, become merged with the Indonesian Communist Party ad, uh, and also other revolutionary organizations and labor unions. Together, these groups organized themselves into a revolutionary movement, which reached its peak in the 1926-27 revolt against colonial authorities. During the beginning of this anti-colonial movement, a diversity of press, press forms emerged, including the revolutionary uh, press. The revolutionary press explained to us those practical processes necessary to create an ordinary people's movement. And I'm arguing here that national consciousness did not, did not emerge emer simply through the existence of the press and native people's reading of the press. As we will see later, the history of the press shows the processes by which the press, accessible only to a few number of natives who could read and write, and really only 1% of the native population at that time could read, at, could read, was able to raise national consciousness and play a role in moving ordinary people in an anti-colonial movement. So as an example of the role of the revolutionary press in this period, I examined the development of Sinar Hindia, which later changed its name into Api. Sinar Hindia means uh, the light of the Indies, and Api means flame. 
showing how it becomes heated, uh, uh, the movement as it's uh, approaching to 1926. Um, this newspaper uh, was the most popular and the biggest native newspaper at the time. Uh, from its first, con I'm studying it from its first conception in May on in May 1918 until its closure in April 1926. Now, uh, to make it easy, uh, now I'm gonna just uh, explain to you how in what way Sinahindia carried specific revolutionary characteristics. The first thing, the first characteristic, they do they did claim themselves as rev revolutionary press. So its content and its existence were outwardly anti-colonial and against the government. They saw, like Tim mentioned, they saw the revolutionary press as a weapon of class struggle, as a means, as tools, and that's uh, their own own word. And and then, and they saw the press as a mediating voice of the Chromo people, the common people, in their struggle with the government. It is a vehicle to voice anti-colonial sentiments and to voice the chromo. And later, chromo is translated by them into proletariat. They use the word proletariat. So they use it uh, to voice the chromo's interest and their oppression. Um, another fascinating uh, thing is, um, I think the journalists themselves self-identified themselves as revolutionary journalists as a way to differentiate their role and their jobs from other kinds of journalists. And at that time, around 1925 as especially, there was a huge debate around the role of journalists in, in movement. And um, I'm going to read you, and it's long, and I think it's worth it. Uh, it's nice to hear their, their vo the voice of uh, these people directly uh, from uh, themselves, right? So in an article written by a revolutionary leader, Darsono, he compared the difference between journalists of bread or rice and journalists as defen defenders. This is what he said. Indeed, the, in the world of journalism, there are cate two categories, journalists of bread or rice and journalists of the defenders. Of course, the destiny of these two journalists is different. Journalists of bread, if they happen to find themselves in trouble because of their writing, it is just an accidental matter. This is because they already take side with the people or the class who have power over bread. And he explained bread here means living necessities. So everything for them is better and more liberating than it is for the journalists or the defenders. The journalists or the defenders in general consist of two groups, the defenders of the workers and peasants and the defenders of our land and nation or the nationalists, right? These two groups of journalists, their mind and action are not interested in money, but are interested in their knowledge and their belief. But the nations who have power over the world, the oppressors, and really they're talking about the Dutch, um, they really hate these revolutionary journalists who defend those who are oppressed and humiliated. Not only do they hate them, but they also create a law to protect themselves so they do not lose their power. The journalists of the defenders, however, are not afraid to suffer or to tire, to be persecuted or to be harassed. In our group, there are many who have become the victims of their writings. But our enemy's purpose to oppress our journalists has not succeeded. Instead, it leads, to, it leads the proletariats to think that if the front row gets oppressed, the back row will replace them by rolling up their sleeves and sharpening their, their pens. One writer down, one writer up. So the contrast here is clearly made between journalists that did not actively involve themselves in the movement and saw the badge of journalism as simply a profession and those that actively took risk and launched active defense for the people. Um, the, the next uh, characteristic is, as I was studying the newspaper, I saw that these revolutionary journalists are also movement leaders. So journalists of this period were not just defenders of the people through their writing, but also leaders of the movement. Um, here are some photos of um, some of the editors. Uh, Samaun is sitting on the far left here, uh, which is the founding editor. And really, uh, they're mostly in the late teenager. Actually, Samaun started when he was 15 years old, and they're either late teenager or early 20, uh, 20s. Uh, it's not pictured in here, but there is one, uh, the first women, a woman recruited to be a, 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 the editorial member, Woro Juina, who is also the leader of the female branch of Islamic Union in 
the mountainous town next to Samarang uh, Salatiga. Um, this, these are the printers uh, in a small room. Uh, we can talk about it more later. But um, so Samaun and Darsono, the founding editors of uh, Sinar Hindia, like other editorial members, were also leaders in the Red Sarekat Islam, as well as other labor unions. Uh, the correspondence of the newspapers ca came from all over Java, West Sumatra, and several outer islands, the regions with the most followers of Red, Sarekat, uh, Red Islamic Union. Together, these people wrote in the newspapers as well as led strikes and public gatherings in remote places across Java, West Sumatra, and some outer islands. Now, the next characteristic that I want to mention is the most striking content of this daily paper that differentiated it and uh, and other revolutionary newspapers from their non-revolutionary counterpart what the, was the meticulous reporting on open bar for hadering and which means public gathering. Now, this is a photo of an example of public gatherings. People, um, one of the communicative characteristics of the communist movement in this period was the use of public gatherings as means to move, to move ordinary people. At a time when most native people of the Dutch East Indies were still illiterate, especially the working class, peasants and workers, Public gatherings were an effective means for popular mobilization and active participation in the movement. Reports in Sinar Hindia between 1920 to 1925 outlined around 900 public gatherings across, held across the East Indies archipelago. These meetings were held in mountainous, coastal, and remote areas with as few as 50 and as many as 10,000 attendees, including men and women, Chinese, Indonesian natives, as well as those of European, Indian, and Arab descent who had settled in the archipelago. Reports on open bar for Hadering involve a detailed account of the speakers involved, the topics discussed, the discussions they came up with, and the details of the debates involved. It was in these meetings that newspapers were usually read aloud and then discussed and these debated. Because the reports were written by local correspondents, the language was not only informal, agitational, and propagandistic, but also dialogical. Here I want to show you the activity of uh, reading uh, uh, as, a pub, uh, as a public activity. So somebody who a younger people, person usually would read a newspaper aloud to uh, the non-literate is, some, is something very common. But uh, so it's not just by the, commun uh, uh, really the communist people during in, in the public gatherings. Um, but it was adopted in the public gatherings as one of their activities. So while the newspapers were read in the gatherings, reports of particular gatherings, especially those that triggered important discussions, often led to discussions and debates in the newspapers. So this interplay between the press and the public gatherings became a unique characteristic of the revolutionary press. It was the core of the revolutionary movement because there was almost no difference between the press and the people. The same journalists and correspondents who were, who were people who led, attended, or reported the public gatherings. These journalists were leaders who found themselves in the midst of things instead of reporting an event as an outsider. Uh, with this, we then also see that there is a culture of reporting that engage ordinary people. And remember, this is a time where we didn't have Twitter or Facebook yet. Um, so from these characteristics, it is clear that the revolutionary press carried with it a specific organizing role in raising anti-colonial consciousness as well as organizing people in the movement. I would like to now end my presentation with a discussion of the colonial state's changing policy on the press in reaction to the revolutionary movement and the revolutionary press. So remember, there was the ethical policy. So during the ethical policy, the Dutch government makes sure that there is a freedom of press and there is a law that said they couldn't uh, close a press activity or oper operation. But during the period of uh, revolutionary press, two policies on the press were released by the colonial government. The first one is Hatzai uh, Artikel, Artikelen. Hatzai means hatred hat, hat sowing uh, in 1914. Uh, it allowed the criminalization of journalists who are seen as disrupting public order and tranquility. So most auditorial members and printer who work for the revolutionary presses were actually continuously since 1918 were arrested, jailed, or exiled to outer islands, or if they're lucky, outside the Indies using this regulation. Uh, by April 1926, Sinar Hindia was forced to close because of 
most of its remaining editors and printers have been arrested. And in November 1926, seven months later, the first communist revolt erupted in several cities in Java and Sumatra. Now, due to the communist revolt of 1926 to 1927, in 1931, the colonial government released press bridal ordinance, which means press banning ordina ordinance. This ordinance, so previously it's only allowed arrest, uh, the criminalization of individual members, right? This ordinance allowed the complete shutdown of press operation altogether, something that was not allowed previously. Previously, the government was only allowed to arrest individual journalists. With this ordinance, the government could arrest the journalists and printers, confiscate the machine, and close down the building. These colonial laws and decrees were later adopted by the young Indonesian nation in 1945, continuing repression against press freedom, despite the fact that Indonesian independence owed so much to the original revolutionary press. Um, in our discussion today about mediating Asia, I think this history of the revolutionary press demonstrates how there is a deep colonial legacy of silencing the voices of dissents, especially those against the government, and to dis dis discipline them through law and regulations, usually in the name of preserving public order and peace. Thank you.